All right, um, let's get started. So good afternoon, everyone. I know more and more are joining. Uh, it's my great honor and pleasure today to introduce our distinguished speaker. It's Professor Joe Chin from City University of Hong Kong. So Joe is a chair professor and also the dean of the School of Data Science in City University in Hong Kong. He's also the director of the Hong Kong Institute for Data Science. So before moving to Hong Kong, he was a professor at the University of South California and even earlier than that, he was a professor at the University of Texas in Austin uh, after working in industry for a few years. So Joe received his PhD from the University of Maryland. Uh, that was in early 1990s. So uh, Professor Joe Chin is uh, very much, uh, I would say, a leading expert in the area of data science in general, and most specifically looking into industrial applications and industrial you know, uh, related analytics problems. So he is a fellow, recently elected to be a fellow of US National Academic Inventors. So that's one of the highest honors that the technology innovation or technology inventors will receive in this country. He is also a fellow of IFEC, that stands for International Federation of Automatic Control, a fellow of IEEE, as many of you know, IEEE is the Institute for Electrical and Electronic Engineers, and a fellow of AISTHE. So he has published many, many papers, I think more than 400 international journals and we see over 32,000 citations with an edge index as high as 76. He has received record, he has been recognized by many research awards and as a career award, best paper awards, and also recognized by multiple uh, teaching awards. He's an editor of many journals uh, in control in general and also data analytics, AI in general. Um, his research covers a wide spectrum of topics related to data analytics, machine learning, process monitoring, model predictive control system identification, smart manufacturing, energy systems, and also predictive maintenance. Um, it's really a great pleasure to, uh, to have Joe presenting today. As you may know, he's now physically located in Hong Kong, so we'll try our difference. This is just past midnight in his time. So please join me to welcome Professor Chin to our seminar program, and we look forward to his presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, Feng Chi, for the nice introduction and also the invitation to uh, give this uh, seminar. Uh, so I had an uh, opportunity to uh, have a conversation with Oliver and, and, and also Madeline. And this is a really a nice uh, audience that I'm talking to. Uh, so uh, as you said, I'm uh, going to talk about uh, data science and data analytics, but I cannot uh, afford uh, to meet the opportunity to talk about systems. Okay. Uh, so really the uh, focus for my talk is to uh, uh, really think about uh, how uh, data analytics and data science uh, and systems uh, will be working together. And in my particular talk is about uh, uh, chemical uh, engineering systems. Uh, I will, I'll try to uh, talk a little bit uh, about uh, the background and then try to talk slowly. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can ask me. Uh, if I'm not seeing my uh, my you know the questions, uh, I think Feng Chi can remind me because I'm I'm projecting the whole thing. I, I don't see the messages easily. Okay, uh, so we're living uh, in the era of uh, big data. Now it's over ten years. Uh, maybe this term has uh, become so popular. Uh, so we know that it has uh, some some very unique features like this uh, four Vs uh, volume, uh, uh, velocity and variety and also uh, veracity, okay. Uh, so so those are the things that we understood now. Uh, but I would just say now, looking back about this uh, word big and data, and they're actually pretty interesting. I think data really triggers the understanding of uh, uh, data. Uh, how do you make decision or inference based on data? So that's more like a, a statistical question. And then big, Big is really the new character of this round of uh, data science. Uh, it's really, uh, really the power of uh, size of data and the ability to compute uh, with a huge uh, volume of data. So really this uh, big data represent computing and statistics, okay? Uh, so my focus uh, of, uh, of this talk actually try to bring the third uh, dimension into this picture, uh, that is systems. So you will hear me talk a, a lot about systems. I think systems is uh, the third component of uh, data science. That is really what we're doing, what we're computing, and what we're getting data from is really uh, usually a system behind that, okay? So we try to relate to systems understanding and systems principles. 
So, so a lot of times we think uh, the, the huge data, they're just data, uh, but uh, when you analyze and you try to interpret and make sense out of data, is they are actually connected. So when data are connected, let's say in the form of a network or, or uh, network systems, they are already a system. Uh, so this is one uh, of my favorite uh, uh, application of data science to uh, all this uh, uh, over eight, uh, 88,000 publications uh, by Nature over 150 years. Okay, uh, this is a cover of the Nature magazine about two years ago. And uh, one of the leading authors is uh, Dr. Uh, Qingke. Uh, he actually did this art. It, what it is, is actually connecting this 88,000 papers over 150 years by the chronological and also causal analysis. Uh, there, for example, if there is a, uh, uh, there is a new uh, discovery about DNA structure, and you'll analyze what happened before that and what happened after that. Okay, so that forms this big dots, small dots, and different colors representing different disciplines. So I'm not going to delve into this too much, but uh, I will suggest that if you're interested, there is like a five minute video on YouTube you can, you can search for. It's beautiful. It's beautifully uh, uh, explained about how data are revealing the systems behind the data in this uh, analysis. Okay, uh, so I'm very fortunate to get this uh, this major uh, author to to join us after August. He'll be part of our school of data science. Okay, now uh, my uh, focus really has to do industrial systems for for the rest of the talk. Uh, so we know in industries uh, there is this uh, three or four revolutions, right? The three ones have happened before and the fourth industrial revolution is coming. And that's, uh, that's basically this uh, line of uh, all these things in this lower chart. Uh, so you can, you can find this uh, internet of things, find uh, this uh, digital twins and big data uh, and other cloud computing, all, all this, okay? Uh, so these are part of the technologies that will facilitate the next industrial revolution. Well, what we're looking for, we're not just uh, just uh, getting uh, fancier things uh, without uh, benefits. So, so we we'll try to say that uh, this fourth uh, industrial revolution is propelling uh, breakthrough improvements in safety, reliability, and productivity. And uh, that's not able to achieve uh, in earlier generations. And also it's trying to derive the derive uh, intelligent decision making using data analytics and AI. So, so these are the components of uh, the, uh, the, the industry 4.0. Data is definitely there. Deriving intelligence and understanding from data it is there. So we're aiming at uh, improving things we would not be able to improve uh, with uh, existing technologies. Okay, uh, so, so I highlighted these uh, components that's relevant uh, to data science. Now, uh, focusing more into industrial uh, processes uh, that's making products, let's say, uh, with a lot of uh, uncertainties and disturbances. And so we, we usually deal with it with industry 3.0. That would be automation, okay, and computing. We call it a, a control. So the process and the control together is our maybe industry 3.0 idea. And you have a multi-level controllers there. Uh, to make sure things are operating under uh, specification. Uh, however, there are a lot of sensors around these systems. So we're already collecting uh, a lot of data. Uh, so by uh, monitoring the data with uh, some analytics like a principal component analysis, uh, we can provide uh, this uh, monitoring of the process conditions and uh, control conditions. So it is uh, in the category of unsupervised uh, monitoring. Uh, but by that, uh, I mean, that's relative to supervised monitoring. Basically what we're making as a product uh, or, or when we're trying to make something, we have some requirements, okay? It needs to have a, a quality uh, spec that needs to be met, okay? Uh, and there are other requirements like energy consumption, like a uh, cost, and, and uh, environmental impact and so on. They all will belong to this uh, results or what you call uh, quality or, or labels, okay? 
Uh, and with that uh, as the ultimate objective, we want to use that to guide uh, the, the condition monitoring of uh, the process side. So this will be called supervised monitoring, all right? Uh, however, on the quality side, uh, data are usually more sparse. And they're not as dense as, uh, as the, the process measurements. And they're also more expensive to measure because it relates to uh, really compositions or, 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 or more like uh, even, even, even things you have to do in the lab, okay? You cannot easily do online measurements. So, so given this uh, uh, imbalanced uh, situation, like a very dense process data and sparse uh, quality data, uh, we still have, can do a lot of things with it. And all, with all this together, uh, we're trying to achieve smart manufacturing. We're trying to extract uh, actionable knowledge uh, from real-time data, okay? And real-timeness is going to be important. So uh, now, uh, in general, I want to use a couple of slides to explain uh, what this data science does, okay? Uh, especially in this context of uh, industry problems. Uh, so, so I will say in one, one sentence that data science sees the dark side, which is uncertainty. Uh, uh, what do I mean by that? I will use uh, this uh, flying an airplane as an example, okay? Uh, so uh, as we deal with the uh, data, uh, try to uh, you know apply data to engineering problems. There's always a competing question, and that is, they say you know we understand uh, chemical reactions, we understand the physics. Why do we need data? Okay, we know all the principles. Uh, your, would your data science replace my engineering principles? Uh, the answer is no, of course. Okay, uh, I, I think uh, uh, the engineering principles that we understood will be there and they could not be replaced by data. But the data is replacing what we don't know. The data is helping us to understand what we don't know, okay? For example, in flying the airplane, we know everything about the airplane, okay? This, they, are, they are designed with the very good engineering principles and, and aerodynamics and other things. We know every part of that, however, when we fly the airplane through, uh, you know, any weather conditions, there is always uncertainty. You can go through turbulence and go through other, other things, thunderstorm and so on. That can be accidents, okay? So why, when we operate something, we know exactly the still cost, it still has problems because there's always the other part of the system that's dark and that's not known. That's not designed by us, okay? So we have to deal with that in the surroundings or the ambience. And, but with the sensors and with the human, like a pilot judgment uh, experience based on what they, what they see, they can operate the plane safe, uh, the, uh, the airplane safely through any weather conditions, okay? Uh, so that's the, really the, the dual side of the issue. Uh, for, I use this, uh, this sort of uh, the yin and yang symbol uh, in the Chinese philosophy that I basically, any system has these two sides. It has the white side, which is known and dark side, which is not known. Okay. And, and, and the dark side should be better known by uh, censoring it, by putting more sensors around it. So we get data and feed it to the decision maker uh, and, or the analyzer. Okay. And so therefore the dark side will get to be more white uh, over time. All right. So that's, uh, that's the, general thing I would say, I would say that the challenge is uh, say how to learn the dark side from data, okay, and uh, uh, develop uh, the right machine learning tools to lead to uh, intelligence. Now, uh, uh, for uh, people with uh, some uh, control systems background, uh, you know there is uh, this uh, very well-developed discipline of uh, system identification which is actually a data-driven method to uh, sort of reverse engineer a uh, system model, okay? Uh, so, so that's uh, more or less parallel to, uh, you know, a statistical design experiment and then modeling, but I will just uh, uh, leave it that way, uh, just uh, focus on the left-hand side, which is uh, what I call system data analytics as opposed to identification, okay? So you can see when we do data analytics for systems, we will deal with the operational data. Uh, that's what happened historically. It's not something we design, okay? And uh, uh, 
uh, it all have high dimensions because we get a lot of new sensors and IIoT. And all these operation data, they are highly collinear, which means uh, a lot of them will follow each other because of uh, physical and chemical principles. And, and, and then uh, they are going to have some dynamics, okay? And they're going to, have, going to be dependent on their history, but they're usually partially dynamic. I will explain more what is a partially dynamic, which means in some dimensions, they are dynamic. In some other dimensions, maybe they are not. There, there are really no memory uh, in some dimensions. Uh, so, so then, uh, given all this, uh, this sort of uh, situations, we need to extract features from data uh, or a good understanding from data so that we can do monitoring, we can interpret, we can also predict. And, and there's another thing we don't uh, mention too much, which is actually very useful, and that is to visualize. And more and more, visualization is, is very important. And therefore, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how to reduce dimension so that uh, that will facilitate uh, visualization. Okay. Okay. And then uh, system theory and data analytics should work together. Uh, that's the message. Okay. Uh, so I will uh, show a, a few examples uh, that we worked on uh, using this uh, uh, approaches, and then I will introduce uh, the main approach we have developed uh, over the last uh, five to 10 years. Uh, we're still uh, in, the part, in the process of uh, uh, developing it, okay? So one is uh, the EEG uh, data, let's say for, for the brain, uh, okay? You, you can either have EEG or MRI uh, data. So they are going to be high dimensional and they are uh, recorded over time and they are going to have very similar features at uh, sort of different uh, side uh, of your brain or different uh, part of your, your, you know, that's, uh, uh, that's where they're recorded. How, however, uh, there are going to be difference because a certain part of the brain will, uh, will do certain things, and other parts will not do it. Uh, so so there will be similar features and there will be times where it could be either due to a uh, artifacts or muscle move, uh, there'll be very local features, okay? So we want to analyze from these high dimensional time series, what's common, what's predictable, and what's special uh, that's uh, representing a particular thing. So that's one, one example. Uh, another example is uh, for uh, power grid, okay? Uh, there was a, a problem in, in Texas early this year, right, for the, the snowstorm. Uh, and this was uh, one of the data sets they, they uh, worked on about eight years ago. We also use this to do our analysis. Uh, there are basically multiple uh, stations uh, about the Texas grid uh, for wind energy. And they have uh, this uh, phasor measurement, uh, which is a uh, you know, very important uh, stability measure of the grid. And they are located uh, in multiple uh, geographical locations. And they want, they usually do similar things like what you show, is shown here on the face, and, but sometimes they don't, and that they want to know which one is leading, and which are the following uh, parts so they can fix uh, quickly where the problem is, okay? Uh, you can find places that are, that are not the same. Uh, so that's a part of a, a time series analysis uh, problem. Uh, and this is a manufacturing process for paper making. Uh, we make paper, we still make a lot of paper, okay? And paper machine is very traditional. They, they, are, they are sort of uh, 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 made uh, at actually pretty fast speed on, on this uh, paper machine. Uh, and when there's problems it develops, uh, sometimes you can have the paper break. Uh, you know, the paper can break. Uh, that's, a, that's a major uh, incident because once the paper breaks, you are not going to make a paper. You have to stop the operation and rewire everything to start it. So, so, so you see uh, some of the recorded uh, sensor data on the right. Uh, when there is a time to about to have uh, issues, uh, there are small things happening like oscillations. And then when it's really breaking, it oscillate uh, a lot. Okay, this is real data. So we, we would want to uh, find this thing early and to to detect the problem and maybe. Uh, fix it before it breaks. Uh, and this uh, last example I will bring is in this uh, chemical uh, manufacturing. Uh, this is a, a very 
uh, is in a complex uh, chemical uh, plant. It's an overall plant uh, of uh, uh, feeding the raw material in and collecting products here. Okay, so how how does it work? Uh, for those of you who are not in chemical engineering, it's it's uh, very difficult. But basically, it, it has a, a process flow through it. Okay, uh, so you basically have to feed the raw material going through the several. Uh, processing uh, have chemical. Usually, in this case, it's it's a physical change. Okay, separations of things. Uh, so then you collect the, the product over here. So, uh, so when you do things right, uh, the raw material will go in and then go through all these uh, uh, units to collect the, the product at the end. However, this is not going to be always uh, ideal. Uh, you will have times where they either have a impurity or some other things that's not processed well. So they have to go uh, back, uh, recycle back to the original entrance. So when this recycle happens, uh, we still want to keep them in the system. Uh, we want to do it again, okay? However, this uh, this thing happened, if this thing happens more, uh, it will reduce the uh, capacity of the, the system to produce products because this is almost like uh, when you, uh, educate students in four years. If you graduate everybody in four years, you get the, the, the most efficient approach. If someone has to be there in five or six years, then you, you will reduce the overall throughput. Okay, it's similar. Uh, so, so, and the other thing actually is more, more uh, uh, serious is we'll have this recycling going on and also a lot of control loops, uh, feedback control. Uh, the whole plant tends to oscillate. And this is not really rare. It's actually quite, quite uh, sort of uh, uh, often happens in real manufacturing. So we now want to see the data like this. Okay, this was uh, recorded uh, at uh, uh, Eastman Chemical. Uh, and they, they are very nice to share data with us uh, so we can study this. So basically, even in the current manufacturing, we see data like this. There are many, many measurements and uh, they oscillate over time. And they, they really have no way to know which one is causing all these things to happen, okay? And uh, they're still able to produce some, some throughput uh, and until to the point they say, okay, this is really not uh, uh, desirable to keep it going anymore. They will maintain, they will stop the thing and uh, do maintenance. So however, we want to uh, really detect what's going on, what's causing this and maybe fix that particular part easily, okay? So that's the data we have, all right? And there's this process system behind this, and that's our, our objective here. And I want to say this, I want to say that the dimension of the measurements will increase more as we get more IoT sensors. However, the system dimension will not increase proportionally. So, so we do have a, we will have a, a, a low dimensional system uh, that we want to understand. Uh, but we want to have more powerful sensors around it so we can get better understanding. So that's our new challenge is that there's going to be sensor rich systems that we are, for, we're dealing with. If you think about uh, the autonomous car driving, I can tell you there's a lot of redundancy in, in, the, in, the, in the car sensors, okay? Video, audio, laser, LIDAR, whatever. And there, there are just so many different sensors, okay? They want to be uh, redundant. Uh, so that's not an issue anymore. It's really we're facing with the sensor rich world. Okay, uh, now let's get down to the problem definition. Uh, what is, uh, what happens now uh, if you have uh, uh, the sort of uh, sources that are not as necessarily high dimension, okay? But when you record data that's uh, measured and that's have higher dimension than what you, you are looking for, and you want to be more uh, accurate, right? With a little bit of redundancy. And so, so this is not unusual anymore. Uh, it's, it's, it's more uh, more common, more and more common with the IIoT. Uh, now let's say uh, we have a say PCA or principal component analysis that will focus on some uh, defined component that say that has the highest variance as a source or highest energy as a source. But uh, in reality, uh, the high energy or high variance may not be of interest. Okay, it's something else that's of interest. For example, I want to know one component that's highly dynamic. For example, if there's oscillation developing, that's more dynamic. Okay, even though the magnitude or energy may not be high. So I want to capture that first. So therefore, let's say if I mix these three things and measure it uh, at five sensors, uh, there's only one 
dynamic uh, thing that I want to extract. How do we do that? Okay, and the other two uh, components may not be dynamic or may not be time dependent at all. So, so I want to extract the time dependent features as early as possible, okay? So that's the thing. Uh, okay. Uh, now, for that problem, I look into the history and the literature. There are similar things uh, we could uh, compare to, but they are not the same. One is PCA, of course. I use this graph to represent. Okay, uh, PCA will not look at the time dependence. Basically, at any given time you have a measurement uh, vector, you can sort of think of it as driven by a, a subset of components, a smaller number of components uh, that's sort of measured at the surface. As, as what you measure, what you can measure uh, on, the, on the sensor side. However, what's driven are by the principal component. And they are, they are, each time is, rare, uh, is responsible for its own time. Okay, there's no time dependence. This uh, tool is very useful. Okay, it's more useful now. Uh, and because it's able to really extract a large component that's a high variance or high energy, and it's able to reduce dimension. Uh, another uh, uh, framework is this hidden Markov model, and that builds in time dependence explicitly at the hidden uh, part, the latent part. Okay, now you can see there's the, from t minus uh, k minus one to k, there's time dependence. Okay, that's the Markov process is one time dependent, uh, and then uh, what you measure is on the surface. Okay, the, the measured part you want to. Uh, infer the, the hidden model, uh, that's called the hidden Markov model. Okay, now this one has a power of uh, building time dependence. Okay, however, it's not going to be explicitly uh, dimension reduction. So our, our task is actually, uh, we need to do both things simultaneously. So we need to really uh, build the dimension reduction, okay? Uh, like the PCA, we need to have a lower dimension uh, in the hidden part. And also this hidden part or the latent part has to be time dependent. So, so you can see this is really uh, combining the, the, uh, the previous two, okay? And the time dependence can be not just the one time uh, step, it could, could develop, uh, it could depend on the past time, you know, many, many steps. So that's the framework uh, we're going to develop. And now to sort of, uh, uh, make it explicit that we're reducing dimension and just say, okay, the, the measurement side has multiple uh, higher dimensions, okay? Uh, so so we're, we're going to work on this uh, scheme uh, in the rest of the talk. All right, so now, now let's do this. I have to sort of define what is the system uh, in this latent arrangement. So now I switch from the uh, the t to tau, okay, because tau uh, usually represent a, a non or, or a statistical uh, process side, okay. So I would say uh, this this hidden tau is what's causing the data to vary, but I I don't measure it, okay. Uh, uh, this hidden tau uh, I also define it to be dynamic, which means uh, it's current time depends on previous time and the conditional expectation is not zero, okay? Uh, and then uh, what I measure here is the data, why? Uh, a larger vector and that's dependent uh, partly on this, this uh, uh, latent system tall, okay? And then there's also additional noise. However, I want the additional noise to be time independent. So if you do the condition on, on past data, it's, it's like it's on, there's no dependence on the past. Okay, so that's my, uh, really that's my system and data. Okay, and uh, particularly make sure that this, uh, this P is a uh, full rank. Of course, it doesn't make sense to make it uh, lower than full rank. And also I want it to be, uh, to be a tall matrix. So there'll be more measurements than, than the hidden, uh, hidden dynamics there. Okay, so that, that is the system. Now, how do we extract this, uh, uh, hidden uh, component and also find the model simultaneously. So that's the pro problem. So I'll say that for this uh, full rank uh, P matrix, uh, tall matrix, there exists another uh, full rank matrix R, 
so that uh, R transpose P equal to identity. So you, you can find this easily if, if, if they're full rank, okay? So there will be easily, you can find the, uh, you know, pseudo inverse, of course, that, that would make, make sense, but I, I'm not going to restrict it to pseudo inverse. Okay, just uh, take this as uh, existing. It's, it's uh, always possible to find R. And now I'm going to use R uh, to combine uh, my measurement to get a T. Uh, you can see I use T instead of tall because I want to do an estimate of tall, okay? And so this is a combination of the uh, measurement to get a, a lower dimensional T vector. And easily because of my condition, here, this 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 rank uh, this uh, this condition. So T is related to tau very clearly, plus some noise. Okay, so make sense. I want to define this T to be my dynamic uh, uh, latent uh, variables. Okay, and that's what we're trying to find, as well as the model structure. Okay, I can put further requirement on R because R can be non-unique. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, non-unique. So I will say. For the number of uh, components here or, or latent variables here, I will partition the R into its column, uh, one, two, three through L. I want to make sure that these uh, columns are, are arranged such that for each uh, T, we, each, each component and its past prediction, its prediction from past, okay, this is like uh, inferred from past, they are going to have maximized correlation. Okay, which means uh, the first, the T uh, latent component I extract will be best predicted by its past values. Okay, so that's the predicted value and that's the data. So they should have the highest uh, correlation. So this is a canonical correlation basically uh, used in this way. Okay, and, and further on, I can even require this. I will require this to be in descending order, which means the first one is most uh, predictable, second one is the uh, second most predictable, and the last few ones could be no, pr not predictable at all. So that's uh, that's my freedom to do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now this is a little bit of manipulation. Uh, it's actually easy because of my condition here and my definition here. So. Uh, so if I do this, uh, uh, this y minus p times uh, t, you think t as a p times r transpose, and then uh, you use this this relation here, t and tau, uh, you'll, you'll have t times tau here and t times tau there, so they all cancel. So you only have the noise component with this y minus p times t, okay? Uh, so, so interestingly, by doing this, you get to something that's time independent. So that's the residual already, okay, it's, it's uh, not dependent uh, over time, even though the data Y is uh, dependent over time. Uh, secondly, if you multiply uh, uh, R transpose onto this, this part, you actually get it to zero because uh, you know, R times uh, P, trans uh, R transpose uh, P is identity. So you have uh, uh, R transpose minus R transpose. Okay, that's, that's a zero. So, so interestingly, What's interesting here? The residual here is time independent. It also lives in a subspace, okay? It lives in the orthogonal subspace of, of uh, R. It's not going to live in R at all because uh, anything in R is, is zero, okay? So it's, it only lives in the subspace. And they, they basically it says the time independent part lives in a small, in, in the sort of a complement subspace orthogonal to the to the dynamic subspace. So I have this expression. Uh, so this is a, it's very simple, but uh, I have, uh, I can tell you, I spent uh, over five years to think about this relation. Okay, <laughs> finally, uh, so it's uh, the data, what you, what you have is going to be uh, sort of uh, loaded uh, by some dynamic component and some non-dynamic component. Each of them come from a smaller uh, subspace. Okay, and the overall thing makes the whole space, okay? So, so that's the uh, sort of the, the uh, geometric picture. And uh, that's important to keep that in mind. All right. Now, now having said that, we actually defined the, the solution process already, the two things in red. So we need to combine the measurements to get uh, the latent variables and to make sure that's what we're, uh, we need. We want to maximize the correlation. Okay. So that's actually already uh, providing the problem formulation. Uh, 
uh, it's combining the data into lower dimensions and then make sure each of the lower dimension is going to have maximized uh, correlation uh, from its past predicted values. Okay, so that's my sort of latent uh, dynamic systems modeling. Uh, let's try to sort of uh, demonstrate this. Uh, uh, we sort of get the algorithm down like uh, three years ago, uh, but I'm going to explain it here. Let's say we have the five measurements. Uh, I said we want to linearly combine them with R, uh, but this R is unknown, okay? And we get a T sequence, uh, a series, uh, but we want this series to be most predictable from its past. So therefore, we're really modeling an uh, unknown sequence. Okay, we're doing two things simultaneously. And to do this, actually we can pretend we know T, okay? Uh, but we're, we don't know, uh, all right? So we can do this autoregressive uh, model for T and predict T, and also try to uh, minimize the difference between uh, you know, the predicted part and, and the data part. So, so that's the general idea, okay? So how, how, how is this possible? And how we're going to do this, I will show it uh, in comparison to, let's say, to PCA maybe. Okay, uh, next uh, is the actual thing for the what I call dynamic inner canonical correlation analysis. And it's like this. So, so that's the sort of the graphical ex expression. Uh, we want to find out such that the T will be most dynamic, all right? And this is really rewriting what I, I did earlier. We want to minimize the difference between the, the latent data and uh, the predicted latent data from its past. And this latent data is combining the measurement. And this is the dynamic part, and that's the combined or dimensional reduction part. So the two things, both R and beta, should be uh, solved simultaneously. Okay. And of course, this, uh, this R represents the uh, say compression or, or dimensional reduction from, from the big, uh, bigger vector y to the smaller vector t. Uh, this is similar to PCA, but uh, our objective are different. If you compare it to PCA, PCA also do this dimension reduction, but PCA only try to uh, minimize uh, some component variance or, or maximize the alternative, okay? So I want to map the, uh, the sort of the minimization objective uh, by defining the minor components here. And this is really the residual. Uh, between data and the principal component. Okay, so principal and minor uh, are already complementary. Uh, and this is uh, in terms of uh, variance. PCA focus on variance, and we focus on predictability in DICCA. So that's the only difference, if you if you will. However, with uh, predictability, we bring in dependence on past data. Okay, uh, now uh, uh, sort of how do we form this uh, algorithm? Uh, uh, we basically uh, need to uh, sort of gather data from uh, one sensor, second sensor, or, or M sensors, okay? Uh, and we form a, a past the window a matrix, try to predict uh, uh, the current window. Uh, so we basically map them, uh, compress them, or, or reduce them by this uh, unknown matrix R. And when it's reduced, you get a smaller dimension, but then the same uh, time index uh, here. And uh, behind this uh, here are the, uh, the previous times. Okay, this is, uh, uh, we need multiple uh, samples to do a modeling uh, uh, effort. So now uh, with this projected thing, even though we don't know how to project it, we can still say use the past uh, horizon to predict the current one and with, with a, a matrix a beta, and therefore we get T, uh, we get T hat from T and so on. So this is all, all also going back to the past. So there is a, a past number of uh, uh, projected or predicted samples we can use to match uh, to the targets uh, of uh, the latent part, okay? So that, that defines the, uh, the objective, which is to maximize the DLV uh, dynamic latent uh, prediction. Again, we are different from PCA and other, other dimension reduction methods because we are uh, trying to maximize in, uh, predictability uh, to enforce the latent scores having the most predictability here. Okay, 
So the two things have, have to be solved simultaneously. And we had we have several solutions already. I'm not going to talk too much in the detail, uh, but uh, certainly, uh, you know, uh, this one is uh, on the PCA, which is on the maximizing covariance, and CCA here is maximizing correlation. And the third paper is a, a better uh, implementation by SVD uh, of the DICCA. Let's look at data. Okay, I have two examples. One is this uh, Lorenzo attractor, and this is a three dimension. People know this is a chaotic process. Uh, it develops, uh, you know, in an interesting uh, trajectory. It is always takes uh, some some uh, sort of uh, its own course. Okay, uh, I want to use this to be the true system hidden. Okay, this is my latent system three dimension, and uh, that looks like that if you look at different angles. Okay, uh, but then I want to make my measurements to be noisy. Make sense? A lot of times we don't have uh, exact measurements. So, so I'm going to create my system uh, uh, like this. Uh, this part is, uh, is, is hidden, uh, okay? It's dynamic, we, that's all we know. Uh, there are three dimensions and we'll, I'm going to use six sensors, okay? And to measure that, sensor reach. And there will be uh, three source of uh, noise things uh, added on top of this uh, when I measure that, okay? Uh, I will add a uh, noise as much as uh, the, the, the signal has, okay? So these are the two matrices, one combining the, the, the real signal, one combining the source, uh, the noise, and then they add to the overall sensor data, okay? So, so you can see this uh, two matrices are, are given there. Uh, this is the combined uh, data, six sensors. It doesn't look like uh, smooth because there are a lot of noise, okay? Uh, now, I find the PCA uh, to get the highest variance component. You can see my three components in the top three are, are this. Okay, very noisy, very noisy. Maybe this one is a little bit uh, like a signal. Okay, so if I do the dynamic latent variable, I get this. So if I extract the top three most predictable components, they are here. Very different from PCA. PCA, okay? Now, is this going to be good? Is this going to be uh, the true thing? Because the, the sensor doesn't have anything like that, uh, very smooth, okay? Let's compare uh, in three dimensions, let's say three sensors. Uh, uh, actually, the hidden part, uh, the, what's generating the signal is the blue, blue butterfly, uh, but then what I measure is going to be the red dots that, that are measured, okay? And that's all we have, it's, it's a red cloud. If I do PCA, I get red cloud. This is a three-dimensional PCA, it's, it just looks like uh, the noise. If I do DICCA, I get this. Okay, exactly like uh, the, the blue part. So so that's uh, that's the power of this, uh, you know, separating noise from signals. And uh, looking at the other way, uh, the left side is a uh, ground truth. Okay, if I don't put any noise, that's what it looks like. And uh, this is the data, I get noisy data. If I apply the, uh, the my method DICCA, I get exactly this. You, you, can, you can compare to the to the ground truth, okay? That's, uh, that's the power of uh, filtering out noise in this way. Because we have more dimensions, so we can, we can uh, deal with noise and signals here. So, so that's, uh, that's uh, the synthetic data. Now I'm going to show how it works on real data, okay? This is, uh, again, this uh, Eastman uh, real process data. Uh, I showed with 40 plus uh, data. I'm going to show just half of them here. And I want to feed it into my analytic engine and I want to get uh, the dynamic latent features uh, in this uh, descending order of predictability happens the first one is most predictable, second one and third one, the second and third most predictable and so on. And last one is least predictable. This is not the last, but I'm going to show just uh, 12 of them, okay? Let's see, what's the first one is uh, connecting to? Uh, the first one connects to these three variables only, somehow it's very sparse. And if you look at this, what's the, the TI3, uh, you know, PV? It's actually ambient temperature of the process, okay? And that happens to be what's on the left-hand side we can identify, oh, it's that signal. 
And that seems like uh, just like the latent variable, okay? Because it's heavily loaded by this very large, uh, large weight. Uh, okay, that's the R part, that's the R matrix, okay? So that's the cause. And the you know, it's really uh, that variation that's highly predictable is actually ambient temperature at 24 hours period. Now, what we are interested in not, is not that ambient temperature. We are, we are interested in this period of oscillation, which is like uh, two hours, almost like around two hours period. What's causing that? So we can do a similar analysis of the causes, okay? And then fix uh, uh, the cause and that'll fix the problem. So that's the, that's the second most predictable thing. And that's our key features. I plotted this first three uh, like this, okay, in three dimensions, so one, two, two, three, and three, one. It looks like this and I can animate it. And so it basically evolves over time. Uh, time is a vertical in this case. Okay, so we can easily visualize, visualize these dynamic features. And we can relate to the problem uh, by this. So, so for process engineer who know data science, uh, okay, I'm mentioning two things. Uh, so they can see, okay, there's a process. I understand the physics and chemistry. Okay, I, I want to collect data from that. And the data looks like this and not so good. So I want to figure out what's causing the oscillations. So it fits to this uh, analytics uh, tool. And then we get this uh, rank ordered uh, latent uh, dynamics. And then I want to find the features that I'm interested. In. Okay, this is the one that uh, really, really bothering all the variations here. And uh, so then, check the cause and then uh, find the problem and fix it. In this particular case, it's a valve problem. It's a control valve problem for a, 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 a reactor, for, for a, a level, okay? And that's LC, LC2. And when that is fixed before and after, this is real data, okay? This is not simulation. So before you can see, this is the throughput uh, FC1 is a flow rate, which is a material uh, feeding through the plant. It's highly oscillating at a lower throughput because it cannot process more. This is like uh, when you graduate students in six years, you cannot uh, admit new freshmen too many, okay? So, but after fixing this uh, valve problem, now you can admit more students or processing about 15% more material and products. So that's the, that's the improvement. Okay, so that's the story of uh, applying data and also with some process understanding, uh, apply data analytics. In particular, we focus on dynamic feature analytics, okay? So uh, uh, this, uh, what I call latent dynamic modeling, uh, I think is fairly uh, novel. We have uh, looked at all the literature uh, we haven't found anything that's uh, the same as ours, okay? But we find similar things in chemometrics, in econometrics, in finance, uh, in this uh, traditional time series uh, analysis, and and uh, and maybe in machine learning. People are doing slow feature analysis. Uh, there are one kind of dynamics, okay? People are doing like a, more, a forecastable component analysis, trying to also extend in our way. Uh, so So there are a lot of similar things. I would say this is a, a very good uh, place to, to do some study. So I have this paper uh, published last year to really uh, try to unify in, in, uh, different efforts in this domain. Uh, it's still in the process of uh, developing, okay? So I'll conclude. Uh, and then uh, I'll say, say a few things. I'll say data analytics brings knowledge about the dark side. Okay, I'm still keeping this uh, in a symbol here. We want to learn the uncertainty part uh, from data. And we want to complement the white side, okay? We don't want to throw away what we know. And then analyzing dynamics of uh, system data is going to require a new framework. Uh, of course, uh, you know, we, we see PCA does one thing, but we're doing some other things, okay? And I wanna say this, uh, very often operational data are partially dynamic and not fully excited. And that we know, you know, if we want full dynamics, we have to do some experiments. Uh, so this is really uh, the same thing said differently. And then lastly, latent dynamic uh, modeling, uh, it's, it can reduce dimension, uh, okay? Find the reduced dynamic dimension, which will facilitate interpretation, prediction, and inference, okay? So we'll make the inference uh, more solid because we know uh, what's predictable, okay? So that's uh, my talk.
uh, thanks for your attention. I'll be happy to discuss uh, and entertain any questions you have. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Joe. This is a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, I think there's a quick question from the chat. The question is asking about is dynamic PCA different? Okay. Uh, is dynamic PCA different or not? Uh, uh, okay, if the dynamic PCA refers to augmenting the data with a very large data window, then uh, dynamic PCA is different. I, I think that uh, dynamic PCA is a very uh, crude way of uh, sort of building some time, some time dependence, but it does not uh, figure out uh, uh, a latent dynamic model, okay? And, and there are also a lot of uh, uh, if you look at uh, our papers, uh, you'll find that uh, we refer to some other references. People already pointed out that dynamic PC uh, can, doesn't uh, always do the job you want. You still look for large variance components. Yeah. Great. I see Oliver on mute. <laughs> Is there a question for Oliver? Oh, uh, Fengqi, thank you. Uh, Joe, that's, uh, that was a great talk. Thank you very much. Um, again, you know, since it's already very late on your side. I have, uh, I have two questions. One is technical and one is kind of uh, you know, re related to this very important conclusion. I'll start with you know, this kind of more you know, related to this conclusion part. So you talk about this data science. Of course, we had a conversation earlier. You know, I, I was keeping thinking, especially you're talking about you know, data science can help us shed light on the dark side that we don't know. This reminds me, if you think that in our, our human discovery, we are like miners, we're like miners and we are treasure hunting, right? And we're treasure hunting in the dark. So now imagine if we are the miners there and do you think of this data science as a shovel in the hand of the miner or do you think a data science could serve as a map or something at higher level than the shovel? So that was my kind of you know question related to that. Yeah, please. Okay, okay, that's uh, that's interesting. I will uh, I will generalize this uh, this shower as a more uh, a general instruments. Okay, uh, uh, as as instruments. Oh, I actually uh, sort of uh, uh, just make a a, a a plain term is that data science is actually a virtual instruments. It will help uh, scientists to discover new things they wouldn't be able to discover without it, okay? And also it'll help engineers to provide the better solutions uh, uh, that they otherwise would not be able to because uh, more and more both scientists and engineers have to deal with high dimensional data, okay? And then through uh, seeing through the high dimensional data, you need data science to do that. That's a that's a, that's my sort of a, I, I say my answer is positive. Yes, it's it's a tool. Uh, it, it's 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 a tool. Okay, uh, but uh, uh, whether it's uh, you know uh, you you will do it uh, without the human involved, uh, that's questionable. Yeah. yeah. Thank, I, you. I think, Thank uh, you. Yeah. For most of the at least uh, the the bigger complex problems. Uh, you want, always want to have the human uh, being part of this, uh, this decision process. Again, I, I try to use uh, the Boeing 737 MAX uh, as an example. I hope I'm not offending anybody, okay, who works for Boeing. <laughs> uh, but that, I think that, that uh, the, the MCS, uh, the system is uh, doing too quickly to bypass the pilot. So, so it was uh, so difficult for the pilot to do anything when that situation happened, therefore it caused two accidents. Okay, so that was a. I I, I think it is it's a it's it should be a tool for the pilot, and, and it's not a replacement of the pilot. That's great. My, my technical question. So Joe, if you talk, you talk a lot about latent variable and, and also PCA, but right? latent variable uh, in, in a lot of hierarchical models, and we uh, you know we built uh, we built in this latent variable, but I, I also actually in scientific discovery or scientific explanation, uh, sometimes actually uh, these latent variables can help the researchers uh, to better tell the story. So for example, in transportation, we cannot really observe whether this person is pro-environment or against environment, but we build this kind of latent variable we call pro-environment is that they can help uh, you know, explain the story, tell the story from the data. But I, I often found it 
uh, you know, uh, at least in my own research, I found it difficult uh, to interpret um, either the latent variable, the covariant, and even PCA. Yeah, they can help us reduce the dimension. But when you try to make sense out of it, yeah, they can be mathematically, statistically beautiful. Yeah, they can provide us with very goodness of uh, fit. But when we come, and also when we write papers, uh, I think we often come across difficulties in making sense, interpreting and explaining such latent variables, and even you know the the uh, the you know the the major kind of you know principles. Hmm. Good. Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I think that triggers two things. One is uh, we need to develop a subsequent tools after PCA or after this uh, latent uh, analysis. For example, this uh, uh, contribution analysis or uh, how they are weighted uh, uh, is uh, even for sparse uh, representations of uh, the weights. And therefore it helps us better interpret uh, what's causing, what's leading to the latent uh, variable you're interested. Okay, that's my answer. Another answer is you need to, to have a specialist uh, involved. And that's why we're training data scientists to be better specialists. Uh, I, I think uh, my current uh, understanding and view is that we're going to have autonomous systems, but not, not too quickly. Okay, we'll develop uh, some, uh, you know, augment human intelligence first and before we substitute <laughs> that. Okay, so, so therefore I think you're right. Uh, there are always going to be uh, need some specialists, some data scientists to, to help interpret that. I think that's why data scientists are so well paid these days. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, I think we have a few questions from the chat. Um, the first one is if the measurements are a mixture of oscillations of different frequencies, what would be the dynamic latent variables? Okay, a very good question. Uh, uh, we don't have to do a simulation because we have our industrial example here is already a mix of uh, multiple frequencies. Even though they're not perfect sinusoidal, there are some kind of uh, uh, oscillations, okay? Uh, uh, for our a surprise and also interesting. We also have uh, uh, the lower uh, scale, uh, slow scale uh, extracted first uh, over faster scales. Uh, and you know, I, I actually I could show uh, you know the, uh, there are actually more than one undesirable oscillation frequencies in this uh, system data. So, so the, first, the, the you know the very first one is 24 hours. That's uh, that appeared first. That's uh, ambient uh, temperature. Okay. The second one is the two hour oscillation period. And there's, a, there's actually a third uh, oscillation going on there is a six hour period, a six minute period, I'm sorry. So six minute. Uh, so, so very nicely, this thing has a, a rank order somehow based on the, uh, the, the, the time scale or, or this uh, fre frequency. Uh, it's not uh, really what we're, uh, we ask you to do, uh, but somehow uh, I think if you look at the dynamic uh, discrete time representation, okay. Uh, this uh, lower frequency one tends to be more time dependent because it moves slower, okay. It's more time dependent, therefore it's better predictable, yeah. Thank you. Another question is on optimization. I think the question is for optimization problem, could we introduce sparse optimization such as lasso type with nuclear norm to have dimension reduction? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. We, uh, I think, uh, if someone will do it, I will be, ha uh, I'll be happy to see that. We're we are actually thinking about doing that because uh, we're dealing with uh, uh, high dimensional image problems, uh, and that uh, image is usually local. Okay, uh, which means in in a say small neighborhood, uh, you want to find uh, the loadings there, find uh, the contributing variables, so you can make them focus on regional instead of the overall thing. That's basically similar to the convolutional neural network, CNN, okay. The regional thing and even for the sparse representation uh, to pick up, uh, pick just the, the, the important ones uh, with, the, with the different norms, L1 norm or nuclear norm, or, you know, those are all possible things, yeah. However, you know, people who work in this area for sparse statistics uh, a lot, uh, I hope someone will uh, look at that for our uh, dynamic component uh, framework. Okay. Great. Um, the last comment is the approach is still offline, which may need computation with new coming data. 
any way that the algorithm can be adaptive, similar to common filter or particle filter? Okay, good question. Uh, the algorithm uh, is actually uh, very much uh, easily adapted over time by you know some numerical uh, tricks like a dynamic, uh, like a, uh, adaptive adaptive uh, PCA. Okay, it's basically uh, one needs to do some kind of uh, uh, sort of updating and downdating uh, of. Uh, it's basically doing a few uh, SVD. If you, you can do a, a adaptive SVD, you can do this uh, adaptively. Yes, yes. And for our experience, uh, uh, our computation is actually quite fast. This is a, this is surprising. It's not a convex problem. We know we know PCA is not a convex problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. However, the, this uh, uh, iterative approach we we we, we develop is. Uh, we, we still need someone to help us prove the convergence, by the way, <laughs> but, but so far it's uh, so, so, so robust, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I guess I have one quick question, you know, just uh, you know, motivated by some of the previous asked questions. So in broader data science community, we assume the data are given, you know, with the given data, no matter it's batch data or online data, we try to analyze everything. And I think at the beginning of the presentation, you talk a lot about internet of things, talk about sensors and so on. So I guess the question is that, is there any way we could have a feedback, you know, where it's saying, that, okay, now we analyze this data using our approach, dynamic, you know, approach as you mentioned, and then we could provide feedback to whoever designed the system and say, okay, we need measurements of these, these, these particular quantities, or we need many, many number of sensors, because you mentioned the test has too many redundant sensors somehow like that. And it's, it's good to have some redundancy, right? It helps to incur resilience. But is there any way we try to give a feedback to the upstream process to tell them that, you know, what quantity is more important to measure? And then the second question I do have is about a mixed data side, right? In our days, we talk about you know, different data. And a lot, of this, a lot of examples are talking about really numerical values, right? Numerical values coming out from sensor measurements. And you know, broadly looking at these are social media, you get a lot of you know, images, you know, videos, voice, mm -hmm. etc., et all kinds of things. The smart home is collecting all the things. How would these algorithm approaches could be applicable to deal with this kind of noisy or messy? I would not say noisy, but for mm -hmm. now it's called messy data and to extract the most information from them. So I think these are just two quick questions, right? motivation. Okay, yeah, 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 yes. I, I, th I think the first one is to have a, uh, maybe basically iterations, okay, uh, to, to say, help us uh, say, get more data. Uh, you know, I think uh, we want to, uh, we, we think that there are things that's not included uh, here. We want to ask for more. Uh, that's, uh, that's usually happens uh, when, for our projects and uh, when we work with the industries. Uh, so that's why we, we like to work with the live data. What I mean live data is not uh, someone who put the data there and then you just take it from the, you know, download it there and then you don't know what's going on. You don't have any interruptions with uh, who generated the data. So we want to uh, build that loop uh, to, to really ask for more and uh, even ask for interpretation is, is helpful. Okay. Uh, and a side thing is uh, we sometimes discuss, discover, discover a, 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 a variable that they don't think that's uh, important. Okay, uh, for example, ambient temperature. You know, people who work in plants, they don't think about that. Okay, they say that's natural. However, <laughs> when we do variance, uh, you know, variability analysis, that often points to an important contributor. Okay, although we cannot control it, uh, but uh, we might control it better uh, yeah. if, if needed, okay. Uh, so, so then the second question is really related to uh, non-ideal, but really, uh, uh, really more and more available multi-model data in, in the computer science or machine learning domain. They call that each different kind of uh, type of mo data is a, a mode, okay, like image or, or other things that's less accurate, but uh, it gives you good things, okay, gives you things you would not um, be able to get a distribution, let's say. So I, th I think uh, that there is a more need to, to merge. Uh, how do we merge this multimodal uh, data? Uh, definitely there is, uh, you know, sensor fusion or, or, or so uh, ideas that could be applied. Uh, I, th I think, uh, uh, you know, there, there is knowledge in each uh, kind of data there. Uh, we, we, we haven't in this current framework, uh, 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 we haven't done that, but that would, that would be nice to do. Great. Well, thank you, Joe. I think there's one last comment from the chat. Um, does the algorithm handle mixing data? Can NEPOS kind of algorithm be introduced? Okay, uh, missing data, right? Yeah. 
Nepal. Nepal. Yeah. Okay. Nepal. I see. I see. Yeah. I, I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it, it handles the mission data because we get natural reconstructions uh, because of the dimension reduction. And Nepal's uh, algorithm uh, that's usually referred to PCA, uh, that the ability of Nepal to handle mission data is also because it reduces dimensions. There is redundancy. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, we can we can handle uh, missing data, uh, but uh, so far our released uh, we we have uh, basically released this algorithm to the public domain. Okay, we we, we did not include the missing data part, but that's important, especially with the time series. Uh, sequence, you don't want to, uh, you know, delete uh, one sample that will mess up the sequence. Okay, you want to use it uh, as much as possible. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess uh, it's very late right now in your time. So thank you very much again, Joe, for a wonderful presentation and for spending time with us today. You know, in the normal schedule, we should give you a gift back from systems engineering physically. But now we have to run this small fortune virtually. So I'm going to talk to Daniel, asking him to mail it to you in Hong Kong. I don't know how long it's going to take for shipping the package all the way from Isaka to Hong Kong. But uh, thank you very, very much again for joining us. And thank you all for attending the Eastern Assistance Seminar this semester. So this is the last and, of course, the most wonderful seminar we had so far. Thank you so much, Joe. OK, hey, thank you. Thanks for the invitation. I really enjoyed uh, these uh, exchanges. OK, all right. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. See you. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.